I should introduce that it's what October third. I just put my hand in frame. I got to remember not to do that. Um, <clears throat> I'm Ryan Maureen, Sam Proctor Oral History Program. I'm sitting here with, I guess you can. Uh, uh, Christine Berry and Juan de Paluque. Yeah. Um, it, you, oh, and Daniel Salas. And uh, our guests here for the Encuentro event this evening are, if you just want to give your names. Yeah. Minerva Hassana Simon. Maria Masque. Milagros Rivera. Fernando Fagundo. Thanks for joining us today. Thank uh, you. <clears throat> so, uh, well, if we can actually kind of start with just what was the importance of La Casita personally to each of you? I want to make an introduction very briefly. Sure. sure. Because I think we have to remember the past mm -hmm. so we can put the creation of La Casita in perspective. Mm -hmm. You know, I, w I came here in 1980, and this university, until a few years before that, was an all white male institution. So a student was a man and he was white. Uh, obviously, the law changed that, and changes began almost immediately. But in 1980, there were still some traces of the past. Uh, so Hispanic students had to come and accommodate themselves to that established style. And many of them didn't feel welcome or felt at home in a big institution like this with that kind of a past. So it was the students who developed the idea and investigated the need for such an activity as a Hispanic <coughs> Institute or La Casita. So anyway, I just want to put that in perspective. Mm -hmm. That was the past. Mm -hmm. Then comes <coughs> the idea and the struggle, which is what most of us were involved in. I would mm -hmm. just add to what you just said, that uh, that background, when Dr. Lombardi became the president of the University of Florida in March of 1990, uh, I was not here at the time Dr. Fagundo was, but within history has shown us because there is a quality of life uh, task force report that indicated that he was able to put together a uh, group of people from the uh, <coughs> Afro American community and from the Hispanic community. And out of that, for the first time, beyond the conversations of the students and the needs expressed, became tangible in black and white in a report the need for an institute. So that's the history. Mm. Can I put a parenthesis in there? Because mm. even though I was a faculty member from 1993 to 2000, I was also a master's student from 1984 to 1987. Mm. So I came at a time when the place was, I wouldn't say hostile, it was just not very welcoming. Um, and as a Latina, and I knew very little English at the time, um, I just had the looks on the stairs and the giggling when I mispronounce a word. Um, and that still happened in the classroom. And it was pretty amazing to me because we had people from different countries. My best friends were from Ghana, Canada, and Netherlands. Mm -hmm. But people laughed at me when I spoke and I mispronounced words. Um, and this is not that long ago. Yeah. Um, so so you f I, I eventually just shut up. I didn't speak because when I spoke, people laughed. Um, and it wasn't a very welcome environment. You felt like an odd person. Yeah. Uh, and when you spoke, everybody looked at you and where are you from or what are you? Um, and, and I think perhaps my hope is that that's not the case anymore or it's not as much because with the 20% student population, the accents are there and the variation of the accents are probably quite broad. Uh, but in those days, it was not many of us. Yes, small number. And I have to say that I also arrived 1980, but not as a staff or faculty, or I was an international student. And uh, La Casita was actually the Center for International Students back then. And I remember needing to go there, and we all were horrified about that place because nothing good ever happened there. And it was kind of like a mildewy old place with piles of papers and all kinds of traveling things, and it was not welcoming. And we didn't have the language either. I didn't have the language. So I remember the same thing that you are saying as a student. And uh, I remember, for instance, funny things like I would say, um, go to the bagel place and, and ask for a bagel with cheese cream. And people would laugh and never tell me what was it that they were laughing about. And it took about a year for me to figure out, figure out that, it, you know, wow, wow, it is, 
a beagle, it's a bagel, not a beagle. So anyway, but those kinds of things that you think is funny now, but you, you, you start accumulating those kinds of things and it gets to the point that um, I was in the Institute of Language, beginning at the Institute of Language, Insti uh, English Language Institute, the ELI, and I decided this is not really a fun environment for somebody that comes from another country um, that already has an identity form, has a Latina, and it was hostile a little bit, you know. And so I went to Santa Fe Community College to be able to study there, and then came back to the university. Um, then came La Casita. So it was such a great experience to walk in that building when it was the Institute of Hispanic and Latino Cultures. Because I went like, well, that's what I'm talking about, all right? It was just like this difference from this very, very, very unwelcoming space to this, well, this is home. It's a safe space. I can be here. And so I, I just I barely, I mean, at that time, I already had finished my master's degree. So all of that time, we didn't have any of that. And I totally agree with the, the task force and all of the students and all of that. And even though I was not involved directly, I was involved through Vivian Correa that was in the task force and she was my boss at special ed. So, I mean, it, it went from like this really kind of ugly place to this really wonderful, welcoming space where all of these wonderful people <laughs> like Fagundo and Minerva and, and all the, you know, supported the students, but it was a student initiative. And, uh, and it was like, I felt I was like floating. <coughs> and I said, I want to be a part of it. So I'm just going to leave it there. Just before we continue, I, want, I, I think that it's important to recognize one person in particular, at least for me. I came to you, I came to Gainesville in 1990, and I obtained employment with the state attorney's office and worked there for a year before I applied for the first ever Hispanic advisor at the University of Florida. Unbeknownst to me at the time, I just knew that there was a position open. I didn't know about the first ever. Uh, I was a part-time position and I was interviewed, which what I look now in, I, I smile because I told Fagundo earlier, I thought I was being interviewed like for a presidency because I went through three committees mm -hmm. for a part-time job, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, to, but I had this desire of working with students. I worked with community involvement in my past and so on before. And, uh, you know, hearing them speak about the language difficulties. I came to this country in 1973 with a English level, probably third, fourth grade, at a senior in high school. So I struggled to my years of college, not only to succeed in college, but to learn the language. And so I have endless stories like the one that Maria just shared about mispronunciation to this minute mm -hmm. of words and people looking at you funny and, and laughing at you. So when I came into the position as the Hispanic student advisor, it was for me important to have a connection with the students because I've been in their shoes and I can yeah. empathize. I was there. Yeah. And what was my blessing and my privilege was to meet someone like Livia Noemi Rodriguez, who to me was the number one person, student driven force behind the Institute. And, mm -hmm. and I think that she needs to be recognized that yeah. while this was a joint effort of so many people sitting here and, and some that cannot be here, but she to me stood above the crowd. Uh, her, her, her energy, her intellect, her abilities were superb. And she helped us. I, I, I was just the person to decide kind of little advocacy and advising and guidance, and, but the driving force between her peers to make that happen. And the question was about vision. And she's a planner. Mm -hmm. I understand what she is because I'm a planner too. She had a vision. Mm -hmm. And she had a vision, she didn't stop. She carried on that vision. And the vision was creating safe space for Hispanic Latino students. And um, um, I, would, I don't know how to define Livia. And I didn't know her how well as you did. But to me, what I learned of her was that she was a diplomat and a strategist. And she knew how to convey the message. And you have all of the documentation so you can see how she presented herself. 
um, is actually something that I find that is very inspiring um, to even be able to read those things and maybe have them orally, you know, read. I mean, they're really powerful documents. So I, I, I agree with you. Without Libya, nothing would have happened. But it was a student who created that because they found the need and they had the vision. Uh, I don't think anybody knew what it was going to become of it, but it had the vision that it needed to be. And, and then, you know, things started moving. And, and getting in geared and, and getting in place. But I'm just going to you know, pass I can, it on. I can add one more thing about Libya. When I uh, left the University of Florida, I became the Secretary of Transportation of Puerto Rico for four years. The governor called me one day and assigned me a task that nobody in the government of Puerto Rico wanted to tackle. And that was to help a community of 28,000 Puerto Ricans with primitive housing and no utilities, no sewers, no nothing. And I thought immediately of Libya. So I called her, she was working somewhere in the United States, and I said, I need you in Puerto Rico right now. And I assigned her the task, and she converted an impossible project into a success. Yes. Uh, the project is, you know, still struggles today with the, all the budget limitations, but she did something that most people thought it was impossible. So. Yeah. And I think if I can add, moving beyond Libya, <clears throat> to the fact that now the Institute no longer is physically there, you're going to need that again. Somebody with that kind of vision beyond the self, mm -hmm. looking at the bigger picture, being able to unite people with different ideas and create a strategy that benefits just more than one group. Yeah. Because the Institute touches the lives of many students even though we are Latinos, that's an artificial label. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. we don't call ourselves Latinos. You're Colombiana and you're Puerto Rican and you're Mexican mm -hmm. or whatever. And you have to be able to bring these people together and find something that they can all rally around and then move forward as a common goal. And I think yeah. that's a gift that she had. Yeah. Finding common grounds. And then that's yeah. what we need now as we recreate the Institute again. How do we get that idea? get everybody around the strategize to move forward mm -hmm. and to get the support for management to realize that this is not a bunch of people asking for different things just a common vision mm -hmm. and once you have a common vision these things become possible it, it, and I, yeah. I think what's essential about that point that you're making is that for you the students if there's a message to give you is that it this has to be student driven yeah it's your needs that need to be met you need to express what it is that you want it to be, mm -hmm. that you need for yourself as an individual and for your peers. And for that, for the ones come come later. And, mm -hmm. and for the ones that would be here in the future. What what legacy, what message, what baton are you gonna hand them mm -hmm. to follow? Mm -hmm. And we're hoping that, at least I am hoping that, as the renewal of the Institute happens in the future, that 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 becomes again, that we have many Livias, mm -hmm. that, and, and I have faith, <clears throat> I believe in the students, I always have, mm -hmm. I always will. I have faith that we will have those Livias yeah. uh, who will stand out and who will make it happen, who will create that unity yeah. and that sense mm -hmm. of belonging because the reason why it was called La Casita was because it was our home, <coughs> our home. <clears throat> that's what they called it, it was our home, it was a sense what was needed is, it's not about learning academia and, and knowledge or history, or it's about a sense of belonging. You know, what, what are your needs? Your fa you know, you have to put in perspective that the majority, 99% of the students, very few come from the local communities, <clears throat> are from either out of the city, out of the county, out of the town, out of the state, out of the country. And they come with emotional needs. They leave behind their families. <clears throat> and if you learn about our cultures, the one mm -hmm. thing that among beyond our language is a commonality to us okay. is that sense of belonging of family. Mm -hmm. uh, Faguno and I were talking as we were coming here, and he, he gave me a, a beautiful analogy about saying, you know, to a student who walks up to him and gives him a hug. And, you know, somebody observes this scene and it's like, that's strange. But it's because. In our culture, when you meet someone like, at that time, a Minerva or a Fagundo, 
We represented family. We were not mm -hmm. administrators mm -hmm. or faculty. Mm -hmm. yeah. We were family to those students. Mm -hmm. And that's something that we wanted to convey to administration. Mm -hmm. I had an, an, an episode where a student, male student, walk up to me in front of Peabody Hall and hug and kiss me in the cheek. And I was called to me by my supervisor about inappropriate behavior. And I said, no, 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 you have to understand this is cultural. This is about, he's looking at me, probably his older sister, his auntie, his mommy, uh, and I'm just feeling that need that he needs a sense of belonging. So that's what it's about. Can I, can I also mention, and I, we need to put this also in, in um, chronological and technological perspective. Mm -hmm. Today you get away from home and you face them, you WhatsApp, you Very call. Cool. You, mm -hmm. In those days, have you left home, you left home for the duration of the whole semester probably. You know, because you had, if your family was in Miami and you were in Gainesville, that was a long drive and not everybody had cars. So that was another role that like a Sita played, a place where you could just come and feel homesick and find other people who understood how you felt. The best yeah. you could do was wait till you got back to your dorm or your housing to make a phone call mm -hmm. at home. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, with a hard line. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> In the wall. In those days. Yeah, it's fun. Um, I want to, I also want to give credit uh, or say that um, vision and excitement is contagious. And I, Libya was the, uh, the, the, the ignition hmm. of this whole movement. But then you had incredible other students like Vanessa Carlo, Carlos Vitales, you know, you remember yes. more names than yes. I do. And, uh, and it became kind of like, um, it, it continued wow. growing, it just continued expanding and it was contagious and more people would join. And so by, I don't know, but during the process of that, you end up with a group of people that is more powerful than individually trying to do things on your own. And I think it has to do with another thing that is very cultural, apart from the hugging and embracing other people, which is our sense of community and mm -hmm. our community, our communal way uh, or or worldview and how we see the world in which we all are part of it and that we embrace each other and so when one person has that kind of idea you have like a morphic field where all of the latinos are kind of like oh yeah pasa? you know and then everybody's kind of like wanting to follow and say yeah and what did you do and what you didn't do and how do we do it and who, who does what and so there was this strategy, there was the vision, there was the person, the initiator, but then was also a group of students that joined, and then a group of faculty, I'm sorry, and staff that, that, that kind of joined them in the effort and supported them to, to fight the fights with the administration and do the negotiating and all those kinds of things. So it, 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 is, it ends up being a community effort, and we function well in community. Um, and uh, to what Minerva was saying about um, also being there as familia, I remember during the time that I was director that we had all kinds of issues with counseling. And I talked a little bit with, with, uh, in the interview this morning about the fact that for us, we talked to our abuelita or tia or something in the table con cafecito and it's an intimate relationship where you really talk about your things. And here we had a counseling center that was forcing us to go see a stranger and tell them very intimate things and to us it was horrifying. And so the institute became a place where the students will come in and we were the bridge to the counseling center. <coughs> and that there was a program developed to kind of make that bridge to be able to kind of warm up the students. The counseling center will send somebody to talk about certain issues and then the, the students will meet them over a lunch or brown bag or something. And then we created the intimacy that was needed for the student to feel safe, to be going over there and talk about whatever issues, rape or whatever things. It's very different than if it happens to somebody else on campus because we have a culture where those kind, especially women, we're told to, I mean, we, we talk to each other in familia. There's things that we don't share with strangers. So um, it was the role of Minerva, my role, the role of Mili, the role of, of, of Fernando was also to be a bridge to students, male and female, on how to get 
counseling or other services that, you know, it was not in our tradition or in our way of looking at life, uh, how we normally do those things. Well, I, so, I would take it one step further. It was more, uh, because I'm sure it happened to all of us. Uh, you, we were doing counseling too. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. the students would come, you know, you can't have a student mm -hmm. in, in, in a crisis or a need yeah. situation. And, okay, hold, hold your horses. <laughs> Let me call this counseling department and make an appointment for no, you. No, that was going to work. Yeah, that no was going to work. Yeah. So you had to have the ability at that moment of assessing the, the situation. If this is something non emergency, I could con connect the student to the services needed, or is it something I must attend to? Close the door and have this conversation and see where I take this issue with this student, which mm -hmm. I will tell you my years here happened many, many mm -hmm. times mm -hmm. with many, many students. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Anything that you could imagine, students with health issues like mm -hmm. bulimia, mm -hmm. students with pregnancy issues, students failing academically, students in financial distress, mm -hmm. students with uh, family issues, yeah. uh, and so on. Mm -hmm. So, it was, you know, to have, you had to, you know, put different hats in different moments. Yes. And, and be, to be able to provide that services. And so it's not about a position itself, but it's about what one as an individual give to that position to help others and, and to do. So I, I, that's how I viewed my, my role. I was the Hispanic student advisor uh, for a year, for the first year. And uh, my role was to do that, to yeah. provide not just general advice in terms yeah. of a guidance or creating an institute or, <coughs> or this and that, but the encompassing, because you have to put this in perspective, 1991, and this university have no yeah. Hispanic administrators. I became that. I have a very, in the scope of a hierarchy, if you will, of the, of the uh, organizational chart, I am at, at the bottom. Yet I have a major responsibility in terms of the connectivity because I am the bridge Mm -hmm. with students to many things. And obviously what was most important for me was not to do it all and to be all because I couldn't, but to have and have the knowledge and ability to channel mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to wherever those needs could be met at whatever given time. But also to have the ability to say, okay, these students in crisis, never mind the counseling center because this is not going to work. Yeah. I need to attend to this now, yeah. which I did. And I'm also, can I mention, um, mm -hmm. because I was a lecturer in 93, mm -hmm. they come to you and they're lost. And to just to know that I could send them there. And, and, and that there would be somebody there who spoke the language, who understood their needs. It was just a fantastic mm -hmm. thing, because otherwise, here we are stepping into a role that we're not necessarily um, trained to perform. Mm -hmm. but, but students mm -hmm. in crisis, sure, you can tell them go to the counseling center, but to send them to the institute, to get that support, yeah. and it's a cultural support, but it's also a family support, familia, mm -hmm. understanding. You know yeah. what I used to say to people? I used to say, when two Latinos meet, we don't have to explain who we are. Mm -hmm. We know who we are, so we go to the issue. When I send them to a non-Latino person, the first thing you have to start is explaining the culture. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so it, it's a two different... And it's not that a one is time. Exactly, yes. it's not that yeah. one right and one is wrong. It's mm -hmm. at that point in time where the needs of that person, you imagine a student in crisis having to walk into a counseling center to try to explain to you first why I'm here and why this is wrong that I'm here mm -hmm. because in my culture this is not accepted and, that, and yeah. then let's go to yeah. the issue. Whereas yeah. they come to me or me or one of us. Yeah. We'll just yeah. go and talk about it. I, I want to give a, a specific <coughs> example. I'm not going to give names to respect the, uh, but this is an example of the kinds of situations that we dealt ha um, with as directors of those institutes, which is totally a council, totally different hat. Um, and uh, I remember that one night I was in my home and it was a rainy night, one of those stormy nights in hurricane mm -hmm. season. And there's a car that is coming down the street and just kind of, you know, I can hear the tires and it's just going like, oh my God, what's going on? And then it stops in front of my house and I lived in one of those cottages that are Florida homes, little tiny ones in the Stephen Foster area. And I hear this boom, 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 climbing and banging at my door. And I'm like, what the hell's going on? You know, um, it was not the best neighborhood in the planet. So I was like, oh God, somebody in, in you know, in drugs or something. Well, it was three students 
that came to my house and they told me, I mean, I see this face and I'm like, they are in sheer terror, okay? And they tell me, you need to come with me. You need to come with us. We need you, Maria, you need to come with us. And I'm trying to ask him what's going on. And they just grab me. I'm in my PJs, okay? <laughs> they grab me and put it in this car and they just keep running around the whole town and we get to a home. Well, there was a student with a gun inside of the bathroom. And she happens to be a woman that I knew that had already have talked to me and had this incredible nightmares going on. She was a Marielito su survivor and I'm Cuban. So I, I'm still emotional about that. Um, I remember that I told the student, make cafecito <laughs> and I'm gonna park in front of the bathroom door, knock at the door. So and so is Maria from the Institute. <coughs> Vamos a hablar. Nada. She kept on like, you know, going on with whatever. And um, everybody in that room, everybody was like, what do we do, what do we do? But I knew something in my heart told me, if you call campus police or anybody, mm -hmm. it's going to be too late. Number one. Number two, then she's gonna be put in an institution or whatnot. And I, I'm Cuban, I know what you've gone to as a refugee and those kinds of things. So I, you know, I asked her, so what's going on with you? And one of the students told me, oh, she had one of those nightmares. And I told her, I have those nightmares too. Blah, 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 <coughs> you know? And suddenly I hear a click. She opened the door and she went back to sitting on the toilet, holding the gun. And so I, the guy came in with the cafecito <laughs> and gave me the cafecito and I was also shaking and I said, mira, vamos a tomar café. And so she just looked at me and, you know, just lowered the hand and I just caressed her hand and took the gun off. If it wasn't for the, the fact that the students came to look for me, she would have not been the successful woman that she is today. She would not be here. And the counseling center would have not done anything. They would have not been able to understand anything. You know, so it, it is something about we identify with each other. And I think the most important thing to consider for those positions has has the, 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 the transition to the new institute happened is that the people who are going to be directing an institute of that nature is not, it can be just an administrator. It cannot be just a job for them. It's not a job. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's something that... It's is familia. It's, it's just familia. It's familia. No, but it's more than that. It's, 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 it's in your heart. It's, it's in your heart home. because it's not an eight to five or an no. eight to 10 job. No. It is a 24 seven. Yes. I used to get those emergency calls, mm -hmm. okay? Show up at their houses. Whenever we had trouble, I'm in my way, okay? Mm -hmm. And show up. I've had guns in my hand from a student. <coughs> me. Well, I have here, they come. There were some difficulties in campus. And I'm like, let me have that. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's just because that's what you do, the safety first. Yeah. Let, and they, to have the respect for a student when you say, let me have that, okay. Minerva said so much, you see? So it, it, it's about, I guess if a moment of, of, of self saying, but people like Maria and I, they knew we care. They knew we care. And when a person comes to you and they know they care, that barriers goes down. Yeah. And that's what matters because yes, we could perform the role as administrator. We've been trained, we're professionals. And you could stand there and do the proper thing. Mm -hmm. But oftentimes with the students and the situations is nothing to do with that. It has to, you know, the students who came to me with the crisis, they, they're going to kick me out of the university. Or I remember one pregnant, if my family find out, they're going to kill me <coughs> because it's not acceptable in the culture of them. They were from Latin America and a mom and dad didn't know that she was with a partner here, a boyfriend. And so what do I do if I send her to over there without knowing there'll be a record and there'll be situations? Let me find out how do I help her to resolve this problem. Never 
understanding that I could never make the decision for her. I just had to yeah. facilitate the resources and say to her, here's your options, you do what's best for you, and I'm here to support you. No, I do think that yeah. conversation is complicated for a woman. Imagine what it's, how it was complicated for me, mm -hmm. getting into that kind of conversation, which it happened several it's, times. It's, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. yeah, and yeah. one person can do it alone. Here's a good example. All of us could go on and on and on about samples of yeah. crises and situations that we, in our own respective roles, help students. Because I couldn't do it alone in the institute. Maria couldn't do it. Millie yeah. can do it. We all have a million other responsibilities <coughs> to do. Mm -hmm. So whoever takes this job have to understand there's no such a thing as eight to five if they're going to be effective. Yeah. It's simply yeah. the reality of the nature of the beast, as they say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, 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 I don't want to sound like like Latino. I don't want people to take the, the, the message that we're trying to say that, that Hispanic Latinos are, are in a crisis mode Correct. all the time. But what we're trying to say is, if correct me if I'm wrong, um, you too, that um, those services that are provided for all of the other students were not available to us. And we pay the same tuition that all of the other students. And uh, the community, our community has crisis as well, has wonderful things going on. So aside from being administrator and being programmer and being all of the different things that you do with the students, you also have to take roles that you're not even trained for or may have some training related to it, but it's not really what you do. And take the risk that, well, I can lose my job for doing this, but what do I rather lose my job or a life, you know, or my love, my, my, my job or, or somebody's future, you know? And so you have to make those decisions. On the moment. On the moment. And there's no chance to, so I don't want anybody to take it like, oh, we're in crisis all the time. But I think it's very relevant that back in those days, uh, the counseling center and the counseling profession in general, not just here, had a very wide model of how to treat um, any kind of emergency and didn't satisfy the needs of African American, Hispanic Latinos, or all kinds of different students. You understand? So I, th that's what I'm trying to convey. And I think this, this, the parting a little bit of like the question was the vision, but what we're trying to say, I think, is that the vision <coughs> needs to be all encompassing on all of all of this. It's not just about, oh, let's have a, a, a cultural center, like you said. It is, and it do is. Talks and activities. It, yeah, and the talks and activities. There are more things that are really important for Hispanic, Latino students, Chicanos, whatever, all, however, Puerto Ricans, Cubanos, Nicaragüenses, things that affect us, things that some of us are separated from our families, some of us are refugees that are here in the United States growing up uh, away from families in our countries in Central America or in Venezuela or whatever you are, and that the needs are going to be very different than you average folk um, and you sometimes are paying double tuition but you're getting a quarter of the services back <laughs> so it's about equality it's not about asking for extras it's about asking for the same that everyone gets on campus and you know? if, if you look historically speaking you're talking 1990 the 80s beginning 1991 you know, this is not, I'm sure this is not unique to the Latino community in general. <coughs> I'm sure that you will see a group of members from the black community mm -hmm. or the Asian community Same. student body, and you will probably hear an echo similar in different manners, but similar to what we are expressing. Mm -hmm. Is that sense that when you have a different cultural upbringing <coughs> and brings a set of, a bit of different way of looking at the world. It's not necessarily that we look at the world different than a non-Hispanic, only to the extent that our experiences have been different and therefore mm -hmm. have shaped our way of mm -hmm. dealing with situations, dealing with life differently. And so the needs of these type of centers, like the Institute of Hispanic Latino Culture or the Institute of Black Culture, or for that matter, for women, uh, is based to me on that. And that's where you have to put in perspective. That's 1991, the University of Florida, on their mandate, had addressed, at least an attempt, to address the needs of the black community because they had a minority officer in every college or almost every college in the university. They had uh, members of the Afro-American community, the black community, 
in many different positions. So they have established <coughs> themselves. Here we come, and there's no nothing that we can relate to it. There's no Millie's, no Fagundo. You know, Fagundo is probably one of three or four professors in the entire <coughs> university system that could say I'm Latino and I speak Spanish. So that's the beginning of the realization and for the students and the formative of creating that vision for an institute. That's a long answer to wow. your question. That's a great answer. <laughs> <laughs> so can I ask also um, for all of you, especially you two as directors, but just how did you manage the emotional toll that this must have? I mean, because this is a lot of work. You're not working just an eight to five or nine to five. And then that's a lot. I mean, that's that's a lot, a lot. You're, you're taking in all of the student stress on top of your stress on top of, like, how did you do it? Well, I, I'll let Maria speak for herself, but I would share with you that I came to Gainesville as a wife of a, uh, my husband was a resident at Chance Hospital doing his residency in psychiatry. So he was gone 90% of the time, you know, 24 hour <coughs> shift and so on. And I was also the mother of two young children. My daughter, Marianella, who in 1990 would have been 11 years old, and my son, Joseph, who would have been nine. So the best I could do was the kids became part of the institute. They hang around. <laughs> the students helped me babysit. Mm -hmm. uh, emotionally, um, as you could see, those emotions stay with us. <laughs> I have them too. There were, I'm sure I could say that there were days that, you know, I would help a student and go to the bathroom and clean my tears. Yeah. At the moment, you're in the presence, you do whatever it needs to, and then you're human. You go and discharge your emotions. I happen to have a background as a child abuse investigator and many other things in helping communities. So I have kind of self-learned to be able to do that. But yes, we were we were very human and very and emotions that sitting here are with me. They don't go away. They don't they don't erase. Particularly those crisis situations, we take to our graves. Those students we remember, and I hope from the bottom of my heart that they're okay. That's all you wanted. It didn't matter our job whether we lost it or not. It was a human life, and if we could make a difference as Maria did, then that's all that mattered at that time. <clears throat> so. Yeah, it's, um, it, it, it takes a toll. Yeah. And it's not just the emotional part too, but you're over overstretched because mm -hmm. you are representing, like I was in the Committee Against Homophobia and Sexism. I was uh, appointed by the provost to the Council of Affirmative Action. Uh, I was uh, in every conference that people needed a token Latino. Oh or, my God. You, you remember those days. <laughs> and, uh, and then also creating programs with the Institute of Black Cultures because we have Afro-Latinos también, mm -hmm. no? And, uh, and we wanted to, we recognized the, the fact that we needed to do something to heal um, a lot of the racism going on. And in fact, in those, in the time that I was in, uh, Katrina, who became uh, pr um, the director of the Institute of Black Cultures, and I sat down with community members from, from uh, Tucson and Kwandaja and, you know, a number of people. And we realized that we needed to talk about racism. And that was a major issue in both of our communities. And, uh, and we needed to kind of have those conversations. So an institute mm -hmm. for healing racism began at IBC that we were part of it. And we would go and sit down in, the, in a circle and talk about, you know, I remember. real experiences. You remember that? Mm -hmm. And so we were trying to do things together, like bringing Afro-Cuban filmmaker uh, Gloria Rolando to the, to the university, uh, bringing, uh, you know, um, different people from different areas that breach the Latino and African connection Mm -hmm. and trying to celebrate those things through art and music and all those things because we did also have issues in our communities that needed to be resolved. We still have issues today, I'm sure, because we all are grown, grown up in, in, in societies that <coughs> teach us that, so we have to unlearn it. And so it be, to create safe space, to be able to sit down and share these things that are really deep, 
Um, and you also have to understand that in those days, we have the, the, the emergence of the white student union, the Ku Klux Klan all over town in 1992, Gainesville celebrated Hitler's birthday in the downtown plaza. So there was a lot of hate crime out, out and inside the university too. So we had to deal with all of those things. It was, it, it was, it was, it was, uh, it, it was really um, a charged time with a lot of like very similar to what we're seeing today. Actually, I was going to say it's very, very similar, similar to, to like what deja we're seeing. It's almost like deja vu. <laughs> Only that now it's worse because it's all the way up, triggering, you know, to places that we just didn't have it before. Um, but it, it, handling the emotion. Okay. I remember I got shingles and I got very sick at one point and it was, you know, I, I was asked by the doctor, do you do have any stressful job? And I went like, no, I'm just the director of the Institute of Hispanic and Latino Cultures. And my partner at that time went like, oh my God, you're such denial. Are you crazy? You drive me crazy when I'm institute. And now you're not going to, you tell me that you don't have a problem. I mean, it was like, Oh, yeah, that's a stressful place, you know? <laughs> you know? But anyway, but I was in total denial. So, I mean, I, that gives you an example of the kind It's funny, I'm laughing because you know? I get a paralyzed back. Yeah, I mean, it's just like one <laughs> morning manifested <laughs> physically. You, you go know? home and, you know, you're talking about releasing stress. One morning I went to move. I couldn't move. My husband had to call an ambulance because I was like a stiff as a rock. I could not move. It took me three days and heavy medication to get my body going. So, yeah, it manifested, you know, in many things like that. Yeah. And uh, you, you do, I don't know. For me, I, you just, I was in the present in the moment. I did what I needed to do to, yeah. <coughs> to deal with it, I guess. And I have been told at least that I'm a strong personality, so I'm sure that helps. Yeah. Don't tell yeah. me you don't know that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm told. Yeah. I, I, it gives a new definition to living in the moment, because oh. we had to live in the moment, but also do the programming and the long-term vision, and where do we get the money, and then suddenly somebody just parachutes in the office, oh my god, and I'm like, oh, okay, stop all of that, Iris, just take care of that, you know, you all leave go the, Leave the report yeah. aside. And then Millie or Fernando, you know, uh, oh, I need you here now, you know. So anyway, so it was just uh, juggling, you know, a it's million the, things. It's a role that while you see a job description and it tells you you got to do these four programs, mm -hmm. a Hispanic student assembly, Hispanic student retreat, uh, <laughs> and, and a couple of other little things. Oh, that doesn't sound bad. You know? It's manageable. Yeah. It's that little word at the end that says other duties as That's assigned. assigned. Mm -hmm. That's 90% as of your time. And the, and, 90%, and the interesting aspect of that was that 50% of that assignment was not assigned. It's just what happens, what life. Mm -hmm. No, no student assigns himself to me or to one of us. They just walk in and mm -hmm. ask for assistance or, mm -hmm. or, or not even that. Sometimes they didn't. Sometimes it was that quiet student who came and you saw the sadness. You knew them. You know, they were bubbly or, you know, had, you know, talkers or so. And then all of a sudden that day, they're like, the light is out. Mm -hmm. And you vacillate, do I interfere and ask? But if I don't, I'm going to be... So you have to put... And then, because our respective positions, which became, by the way, in I was hired in June of 91. I was half-time officially, by the way. I never worked part-time. The minimum I worked... When I was part-time, I worked 30 to 35 hours a week. <laughs> when I was full-time, I worked about 60 to 70 hours a week. That yeah. was the nature yeah. of the. Certainly, there were periods where there were reasonable weeks, but peak time, probably 70% of the time, between Hispanic heritage and new students, and fall is coming, and the spring started, and the summer is coming. It was never ending. There was something. And the multiplicity of the hats that we <coughs> had in terms mm -hmm. of you're an administrator, you're an advisor, you're this, you're that, it was like put your hand in a hat and pick a, a title whatever it was, mm -hmm. uh, and so that you have to deal with administration all the way to the president. You have to represent, you are the token Hispanic for everything, everything administrative in this campus. Our job became that because there was nobody else. Faculty usually were not allowed to do that other than being in committees because they must produce. You know, they, they're like, but they we must, spent a lot of time with us. Yes. They yes. did that, yeah. they did that, yeah. but, but they, 
did it out of their kindness, out of their extra efforts <coughs> to help the students. For us, it was like an expectation on written that we must be there. You must be in this committee. You must be in the other committee. You may, endless committees, endless meetings. And then, <coughs> I'm sure it happened to you, come particular Hispanic Heritage Month, the beauty of you have to be the guest speaker for everything in education, in mm -hmm. advertising, and, and so on and so on. So, so professor, we have race relations and those, you're there, whether you presented or part of a panel or something. So it was never the job description. I'm trying to think if we could put together probably about five pages long, I you know the yeah. individual things that we did, generally speaking, yeah. in terms of categories. Mm -hmm. That's a lot. No, we did it. We're here. Look at us. <laughs> <laughs> we survived. We survived. If I can have here. the teacher, I survived. <laughs> yeah. uh, and it was a pleasure, though. It was fun. Yeah. It was fun, believe it or not. Well, so you mentioned uh, it's Iris Campbell, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Iris Campbell. But what could you say about her and kind of the role of mm -hmm. what she did? Work? Yeah. I hired Iris Campbell. She was when I was transferred to the Institute in April of 1994. And just prior to that, my position in student services <coughs> was eliminated. So I was literally transferred. I no longer was Hispanic student advisor. Now I became assistant director, by the way. I was never given the official mm -hmm. title of director. Mm -hmm. I became the assistant director of the Institute of Hispanic Cultures. And uh, so I needed help because somebody had to answer the phone while I was all over campus. So we hired Iris and there were some uh, work study students. Mm -hmm. But Iris, I was blessed because she would, didn't become <coughs> the secretary neither. Mm -hmm. Again, being of our culture, mm -hmm. she became another mom in the office. Yes, she was yeah. And the students loved her. And she was so personable. And uh, so I was just blessed that we found somebody like her. Yeah. Yeah, actually, and I was so blessed that you hired her because without Iris, I don't think we could have been able to do all the programming and all of the things that we did. Because she actually was really good also. Uh, okay, all of the students that were, you know, student assistants, it was like, okay, you do that, mi amor, and you do that, mi niñito, y tú haces aquello, y tú, 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 and then she would distribute the thing, but little pieces so that nobody would just, and everybody would go like, oh, and then they were very happy of doing it. And then you know, and then, then they were all even more happier. They were even happier when the when they were in the middle of the program, and it was a tremendous success. So she was really good at coordinating and yes. delegating and those kinds of things. So um, and always have time for the cafecito. Like if somebody will come in, ah, oh, you don't look very happy today. Vamos a tomar un cafecito, and then she will go and do the coffee in the kitchen, and that everything got resolved with a cafecito. That was the feel of the yeah. moment for us. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, I don't know how many coffees I drank a day, but I, sometimes I would tell, no, no cafe more. I, I'm kind of like shaking now. <laughs> Just leave the coffee for later. But anyway, it's, yeah, I was, it was tremendous. I wish we could have find her yeah. and bring her to this event because she was a tremendous help. And she not only was a tremendous um, um, uh, partner, I would call her, because like you said, it was beyond being an administrative assistant. She took up the role of just being the front of the house when we were doing all of our things around campus and, and somebody needed to be coordinating something else, you know. And, uh, and I remember that, I don't know, it, it was just, uh, it was extremely a loyal. Yeah. Uh, I could leave that office in, mm -hmm. in confidence that Anything that was going to happen when I got back, she was a minerva this, this, and that, so you'll know. Um, like I say, I was just blessed that I picked the right person for what we needed at mm -hmm. the time, and I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. I also knew, I won't get into it, but she had some health issues, and I, and I pray to God that she's okay. Yeah. I lost track with her, but I know that. Yeah, but even with I'm that, and she <clears throat> just managed to just yeah. deal with everything. And I, I think the most important role that she played in there was to provide continuity be between different directors, because what you what you accomplished was not lost, because Iris passed it on. 
And then instead of starting all over from zero, we continue everything yeah. that was going on. You remember that? And then things grow. So there were more programs and students wanted more things. <coughs> but then it, you, you become stronger because instead of starting all over once, over Just and continue. over and over, yeah. she provided that continuity. So I don't know until mm -hmm. how, how, how long more she and who was, you know, <coughs> when she left. But I'm sure that um, she, she moved forward what, uh, what everything that was done she during my time. She must have left sometimes well. in the late 90s because my son came here to the University of Florida. I'm also a mom gator mm -hmm. and, and often alumni. And uh, I came to the institute and she was no longer there. And I asked about her and nobody knew. Nobody knew who I was, nobody <laughs> Do you remember any stories about Iris or any, any particular moments stand out? Kind of? I there were so many every day. I kind of have to pinpoint one. Um, trying to remember. So if you remember one before me. <laughs> I have one and, I, I can't, and again, I cannot name names. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was People Awareness Week, and I was invited to speak at the Plaza of the Americas because I'm um, uh, at the Institute of Hispanic Latino Cultures. And uh, the day before my speech, uh, or it was a very brief speech anyway, but it, we all were told to say something about um, um, LGBT community. It was an LGBT event. So the night before this event, I have five Latino LGBT students storm into the office. What are you going to do about this? You need to participate in this event, you know? <coughs> and so they kind of plug me into it, and I'm like, okay, not a problem. You know, I'm queer, so I can do that. So, oh, God forbid the alligator put like half a sentence of what I did say in a quote, and it was not even revelatory that much but it insulted one of the Hispanic faculty to the point that he stormed into my office and you know, told me all kinds of insults and how you dare and da 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 da. And so I was just opened the door when he's coming in and just like, oh, so and so is coming. I'm making coffee because this is gonna be a hard one. And she just closed <laughs> the door and went into the kitchen. And so while he's just saying all of these things, the coffee's brewing. <coughs> And he goes like, ay, ay, he está haciendo cafecito. And Iris comes in with the coffee. Oh, how are you? How are you, Mr. So-and-so? Uh, do you want some coffee here? I know you like it with cream and sugar. And so he started drinking the coffee and he forgot what he was talking about. And I'm like, thank you. And that was the thing. She was always in the right time to do the thing and, and just come up with some creative way of how to make a distraction about something that could turn into a horror story. And then from then on, there was this, you know, pretend that I never said anything, you know, so that was the end of the story. And then with a cafecito from Iris. So that, so, so those were the kind of things that when, when, when we, she knew intu intuitively by looking at somebody's face, the way they walk, whatnot, when she needed to storm into my office and interrupt and create a scenario or tell a joke. She was a master. She was, she was a you, master. She was yeah. a master at that. She yeah. knew, I didn't have to say to Iris, no one, no need interruptions <coughs> and going to my office and do something. She just knew. She, yeah. just, if, she knew if I closed my door, she knew when to interrupt and when not to. She just mm -hmm. had that ability to do yeah. so. Yeah. And, and was always accurate about what, you know, mm -hmm. if she interrupted. So soon after she did that, by the third time, you got to trust her that yeah. if she interrupted, you must be it's, a it's, good reason why it was. Yeah. The same in the phone. <laughs> if she interrupted me with a phone conversation, I knew that if Iris was calling me, it was must be important. Otherwise, she would handle it. Mm -hmm. And you wouldn't even know about it. Yeah. 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 So she, she was like, yeah, a blessing for the Institute. Um, I think she was the right hand of either one of us. And uh, it was, and it, to me, it was an equal partner. It was not somebody who was doing administrative work or anything like that. I would have not been able to survive in many instances without Iris Campbell and her sense of humor. Because I would just go like, oh my God, I can't believe that this, that. And she go, do you remember that time? La, 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 la. And tell me a joke about something in Puerto Rico. And I would just laugh. <laughs> my heart off mm -hmm. and then like okay now let's go do this you I'll know give you a look. I mean, she had this way of giving you the look you know yeah just that, like, too. Okay, that too <laughs> and then you knew that you needed okay let's, let's yeah. stop now yeah 
So there, it was a very interesting equal relationship in between us and there. And um, she was a great manager of the students and all of the, their needs and, and the mom too. Um, students will come to tell, I, they will come and just go in and sit down. Ay, Iris, mira lo que me pasó. Da, 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 da. Y por ahí se va. And then when they just soltaron el cuento, then venía a mi oficina. So what are you going to do to help me out with this? You know, so I mean, it's just like, but it would begin in Iris' office and it would trigger all the way to, you know, the director's office. Also a good resource to know when students needed help. Mm -hmm. They might show up, but not talk. And mm -hmm. she will say, come to me and say, I think you need to talk to someone. So, mm -hmm. yeah. what's going on? Oh, I noticed this. Okay, you see. <laughs> yeah, very intuitive. Very yeah. intuitive. And I don't know, but you all have great stories about. Iris we interacted too. with her yes. only when we went to the institute. Mm -hmm. You guys were there all the time. Mm -hmm. but we just came to events, and mm -hmm. she was the heart of it. I mean, she was really a force at the institute. In, in every event that happened mm -hmm. at La Casita, it was like it was her own party. <laughs> Like she was so happy, you know, that it was contagious. Again, all of these things are about, you know, <coughs> the, 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 the effect of how this, you know, heart to heart connection kind of way of, of dealing with the, with the institutes, how it worked. Like, because we work hard on the programming, we work hard on the analytical part, we work hard on the negotiating with the administrators, we work hard on anything, but you also needed to have a heart there. It was not just a mental and capacity and skills kind of thing. But that's what made La Casita La Casita. Yeah. You see, you go in there and you have somebody who welcomes you like a yeah. mom, who makes you feel good, who serves you coffee, who listens to you. Sure, it's an institute of Hispanic Latino culture, but part of the culture is that family, that welcoming, mm -hmm. that embracing. And mm -hmm. she did that. The, yeah. More than an extension beyond Iris, uh, <clears throat> just there's one little piece here that we haven't mentioned. The parents. Mm -hmm. I had so many parents, mm -hmm. once we started with La Casita, show <coughs> At times it was funny because they would say, Le dejo a mi niño, a mi niño. <laughs> like, like they were handing me yeah. their baby to babysit. And you're responsible for my child's yes, well-being. You're responsible yes, yes, for yeah. my child's well-being. Yeah. And you know, I always have to make, professionally make it very clear that <laughs> I'm here to support your son and daughter, but I can't watch it 24 seven. And the young people would just smile. You know, they would look at me like smile. Yeah, I'm not coming by, you know, just <laughs> freshmen. And, but the caring of those parents, I still have at my house, mm -hmm a set of prints of a father of a student, his last name is Siobir. And I say that because the, the gentleman brought me a set of posters, uh, something to do with planning, and I still have them. And the young man next year, he, he came, he liked me, he said, next time I'm, and he was from, I think Venezuela, but don't quote me, he was from Latin, and he showed up with that and it, uh, Soon thereafter, his son graduated. He came to his son graduation, and he had a stroke, and ended up at Chance Hospital. And I can't recall whether he passed away, or not, but I think he did. <laughs> the father and the young man was graduating. So, you know, things like that that happen to you. Here I am, twenty. I still carry those posters wherever I go. They're with me in a, in a tube, mm -hmm. you know. And he may actually he didn't give them to me. He mailed them to me. I have the 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 address, the label, and mm -hmm. the posters. So the parents, you, you know, so how did you explain to administration that we as administrators are not supposed to, because that's what we technically were considered, uh, uh, give gifts, you know, there's laws yeah. and mm -hmm. you can say, how did you insult a parent who show up at your office with a bouquet of flowers? Yeah. And because they might cost more than $25, you have to say, no, you can't keep them. I used yeah. to say, well, let them, fire me if they want to, but I'm going to insult this family. So yeah. of course I would give them a hug and thank you. And that was sweet of you and enjoy my flowers for a couple of weeks. Or the students who went back home and came back and brought me a little souvenir. Mm -hmm. I still have a number of them, mm -hmm. you know, little things <coughs> in Colombia with a bunch of tropes yeah. and fruits mm -hmm. inside and you know, the little car or the little thing from Puerto Rico or one brought me that I won, I lost. A Mexican hat, you know, a real sombrero thing expensive for me and I had to hang in at, at the office. But you had to do those things. That's where you kind of quite broke the rules of the university, but it was a greater purpose. You, they felt pride that they walked in there mm -hmm. and 
that little gift they brought me was hanging, that it was yeah. there at the corner of my desk, that it was here, that it was there. Yeah, and that's another thing that it, it, the institute became, um, it, it shaped and it changed by the students. Um, it, it started deciding what kind of art to hang from mm -hmm. it, what kind of arrangement they wanted inside. So yes, it, it keeps changing. It keeps changing. Has the different, you know, students are here for only a period of time. So every group of students that came had different needs and different ideas of how they felt you know, the space should look like and what kind of artist they wanted the art from it and those kinds of things. So, um, I, and, and, you know, there was a time where there were a big influx of poets and we had poetry slams and um, they, everybody would come with a little paper and read the poem and they wrote poems and poetry and those kinds of things. And, uh, and there were, I mean, it was not always one thing fix, fixes all. It was constantly changing, constantly emerging and, and evolving and growing. Um, so that's why I think it's really important to, to know how important it is the role of a director of an institute of this, this type. Uh, because a person that is just going to be an administrator is not going to do the kinds of things that are going to provide that continuity, that are going to provide the inspiration for students to come and feel welcome, that are going to provide la casita feeling. Hmm. It's just going to be another uh, office of the University of Florida. And uh, that's not what I think many students are looking for, but I don't know. I would like to ask students, I don't want to talk for them, I would like to ask students today, so what is it that they're looking for as it moves forward? Because I think the vision will need to be refined to see what are the needs of the students of today. However, the way the administration sort of handles things, I don't think that has changed that much. No, not, not, from, not from, from from what we hear. We don't hear yeah. in the history of what has happened. Yeah. So, <clears throat> you know. I, I have another couple questions. I don't know if either of you wanted to jump in. <coughs> so this is a little unrelated, but I know. Um, I think Livia was involved, but I know Vanessa Carlo was involved in trying to get Latino studies started here as well, in addition to La Casita. What are you, do you see any importance in an interrelationship between the two? Like, what's yeah, definitely. Yeah. Well, I, those thoughts I think started just in that transition with Vanessa and Livia, so mm -hmm. it got more formative with Maria. But I think the original concept, and I'm sure it was expanded, was that <coughs> here we have a Latin American center. And this university is known for the quality of, of research and studies in that field. But their very own Latinos, no one knows anything about it. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. why can't we have, let's start at least with one class, you know, educating, mm -hmm. workshops, mm -hmm. seminars. So that's and that was the what, what happened after I left, but that was the, yeah. the concept of we. And, and I can talk a little bit about Nina Menendez, actually, mm -hmm. who was the, you remember, the mm -hmm. professor from Romance Language, um, <coughs> professor of Romance Languages and Spanish. Mm -hmm. um, she took the role of moving forward with that idea and work with Vanessa for a while, but then it was working with the, the groups at the Romance Languages and different, and you know, students and all that. So they came up with a list that actually started the library. And they also started working on curriculum for um, the courses that they thought about would be necessary about Latinos in the U.S. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but one of the things that happens when you lose the people who are leading something, Nina and I left pretty much at the same time. So, uh, and Vanessa had left already. So, I mean, the people that were kind of moving that forward, I think that kind of got stalled. I don't know if anything happened. I really don't know the history of what happened to it. But I know that we had a library that people would come and read. And it was not that big library, but it was books that were being donated from like Sandra Cisneros and, you know, different, different uh, people from Latinos from the U.S. And so um, that, that was a, a strong push and there was a committee and Nina led that committee. So I, I could probably contact her and know what happened, if she had any of the, but I remember seeing a curriculum that was started to begin talking about Latinos in the U.S. 
we, we I remember so, we bring in, uh, and I don't know, I said we, to be honest, I don't know if it was the university or the community, because I think <coughs> Emiliano, mm -hmm. uh, Wanda, uh, the, uh, the owner, got involved with this, because I attended an activity where we brought Ana Castillo, yeah, a um, Chicana writer. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I have taken a group of students to the National Puerto Rican Coalition, and I have met uh, Isa uh, Isaura Santiago. Mm -hmm. uh, so we began to know, you know, just expanding into literature and yeah. people. Yeah, and at that time, now that you mentioned Ana Castillo, mm -hmm. Ana Castillo moved to Gainesville because she was married to a professor at the University of Florida at that time. And Ana mm -hmm. and Wanda, and Ali, la hermana de Wanda, yeah. and Ali, my partner, and I, we form, uh, in Leticia Solaun, yes. uh, we form Alianza Latina. And if you Google Alianza Latina, Gainesville, Florida, you still have, we register that and you still find the same that I comes attended up. those first meetings. Yeah, and so, and so and uh, so I was, uh, I think Wanda was the president, I was vice president, and I, I, Ali, the Wanda's uh, sister, younger sister, was a uh, treasurer or something like that. But um, but we were trying to do deal with the, the issues of uh, movies, Latino movies, with cultural issues. And Ana Castillo actually gave us a, a, a format for something that she used to do uh, with Francisco Alarcón in San Francisco. <coughs> that is, it was a program where you combine theater and movies and all kinds of things. And uh, I know that Wanda continue uh, maybe not has Alianza Latina because all of us moved out of town, but uh, and that was a community work that was associated to the university. One that was instrumental with a lot of the things as a supporter of the institute, and Emberta um, Cartes also was in Alianza Latina, and she was a big donor for of funding for bringing different artists and different people to it from Peru, from Cuba, from different areas. Um, so. Um, at that time that that was formed, you know, it, we met everyone, we moved on, Wanda stayed, and uh, she continued being part of the film make, the Latino film, make, uh, film festival. And I think she's still working on those <coughs> uh, up to today in the community. So I don't know, I need to talk to her. I haven't seen her this trip, mm -hmm. but I know that through the years she, she carried that uh, further and was in charge of organizing it and finding funding and f choosing the movies. They have a they have a committee that works with that. Um, so I think the important thing was that we were working with people from the community. We were working. You you mentioned yesterday the tentacles. Mm -hmm. uh, you establish all those connections with the National Council of La Raza, the National Puerto Rican Coalition, um, all of those different organizations like Conchitreyes Bretos and the Commission of Hispanic Affairs in the state, and all of those things that were formed during the time that Minerva was there were carried on because those were our tentacles. Those people came to our, our Hispanic Heritage Month or our Hispanic Assembly as speakers or as, or as members of the Hispanic Collegiate Forum, and they were there. They were a presence. So we had those tentacles nationally, statewide. And I, uh, one of the things that I wanted to do, because I'm a writer, was to get us out in the press. And there were reviewers from Temas, New York. There were reviewers for, uh, from Hispanic Review. And we got articles about the Institute published in Hispanic outlook of higher education. So it was an effort <coughs> to just put us out everywhere. And I have to say, it became not just only for the University of Florida, but it was the best institute in the southeast of the United States. And uh, when the Hispanic Latino Collegiate Forum formed, uh, an organization developed from that group, from all of the different universities in the state of Florida that was called Florida Hope and that was Hispanics organized to promote empowerment. So those people, the, the students have uh, the, their, their, their representatives, their chairs in each one of the universities. And then whomever was either the Hispanic uh, advisor or the whatever the titles were in the different universities, here was the director of the institute, um, 
work with the student of each of the universities because each year when the, the collegiate forum convene here at the University of Florida, the students who came from all of Florida and there was a, a forum for Florida Hope talking about what would be the vision to continue to unify the state. So I, the institute was not just for the, the institute, I mean, for the University of Florida. We were getting recognition. The University of Florida was getting recognition nationwide and statewide. And we were being the role models at that time, even with people from South Florida who looked at us and say like, whoa, these people in the swamp came up with this idea. What were we thinking? You know? So, and then suddenly we just kind of like, it became something that triggered. And I got to say, Vanessa, which is so good mm -hmm. at getting people pushed and get them enthusiastic and injecting them with passion. And once that started, it just continue in the three forums that I saw. It was just the growth from one to the next. The letters that came from the different advisors from all of the universities, even the ones like Florida International University, they love to come to the forum here because it was like, oh my God, we have this going on. So um, I, I watched from a distance. At yeah. that point, I was gone and but, I was like, you so know, proud of that baby that started. Yeah, you started the whole thing. So it's just, it's, a, it's an issue of continuity. But what I'm trying to say here is that, you know, if the University of Florida just was run an F, because of the lack of diversity. Well, one of the great tools that the university has is all of these groups. And if we were allowed to do what we're supposed to be doing, okay? If we were allowed to do what we're supposed to be doing for our own communities and for the university community as a whole, because there's this vision or this, <clears throat> this wrong way of looking at it has me and the other. And actually, it is all a community part of the university. If we're allowed to do our work properly, this university will rank an A, and I can guarantee you that, because we will be able to offer the programs that recruit and retrain in, in, in the safe spaces where the students feel welcome, and then they will go like, well, what? No, I'm going to the University of Florida, which was what was going on back then mm -hmm. that increased the, 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 well, the rate of students. We and started uh, with 2,400. Yeah. By the time I left, which was left three years later, we were up to 3,000. I am so happy to hear that now we're in the 10,000s. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, one, thing to add to what Maria is saying is that, you know, the institute or any institute shouldn't be looked at as an add-on to keep those people quiet. Mm -hmm. So I'm saying, it's not about that. It, we live in a multicultural world. Yeah. And if you deprive yourself of learning about your fellow humans, mm -hmm. then you just shut the door <coughs> on living. Yeah. Because I got news for you, no matter where you go in this world, we're there. Okay? Yeah. I don't know one corner from South Africa to Alaska to where you go that you don't find a Latino. Okay? So to me, I look at it as the university should be proud, should embrace us as a community, that we have such much talent among the students, that we have dedicated and committed faculty, that we have staff giving 150% to what is makes them look good. Mm -hmm. They should stand and say, we are the U. I mean, I love this institution for many <coughs> reasons, you know. I fought them about m meeting the needs of our community, but yeah. the fight wasn't about I'm good and you're bad. The fight of us helped me make us even better than what we are. And I really think all the tools are there. Mm -hmm. um, hopefully, you know, so sad to hear, for me, to hear the news that here we're getting an F. Yeah. It's not even a matter of a grade. Put the F or the A aside. Think about what that implies. Mm -hmm. It means that our students' needs are not being met. Yeah. And that breaks my heart. Mm -hmm. Because all the effort that these people have put into it, all of us, from the bottom of our heart, to see it all like, all of a sudden we reach here and then we fell off the cliff. Mm -hmm. Not even backpedal, we fell off. And now we are like, we're at the bottom and trying to climb out. And I hope for you, the students, I hope that what you get from us is that that inspire you to say, 
Sí se puede. Yeah. Yes, we yeah. can. Yeah. Yes, we can. <coughs> so, you know, whenever you, I always look at problems, so-called, they're challenges. That's what I thought. Mm -hmm. If I ever thought that my problems here were problems, I would have been nowhere. Yeah. I just said, oh, that's a challenge. There's more than one way to skin a cat. How am I going to do this one? Mm -hmm. That's how it was. And it wasn't about me. It was about how can I help the students push them this way or that way or help them from getting into this trouble or that. But it happens. When everybody put that little grain of sand into, you form a rock and you can break that rock. <laughs> and I am convinced that is hopefully a year from now when you have that building. I meant we were talking earlier about that. I said, make it a la casita, whatever it was. Get that sense of belonging, that mm -hmm. culture, that art, that thing. It would be sad to walk into a building and see four white walls, very pristine and, you know, untouched. Make it a place that people, you know, sitting and talking and al cafecito yeah. and... Yeah. Because that gives you a sense of belonging. Mm -hmm. Because I bet you, you will call the, the Viviana Delgado, the Livia, the Eloy Villasuso, the Juan Vital. The, I mean, I could write around and all those things. Mm -hmm. They're with me, you mm -hmm. know? And call them and say, do you remember your time at UF? And it'll be so fascinating to hear what they say. Those student retreats, we had, in addition to Hispanic, uh, during the Hispanic week, we also did one retreat a year where we took the leadership. And we not only took Hispanic students, we invited mm -hmm. student government presidents and vice presidents, we invited black members of the Black Institute. Why? Because it was about the leadership and collaborating <coughs> and working together. Mm -hmm. But apart from all the learning that we tried to teach them in collaboration, we had a ball. We had fun. Yeah. And it was just, it was that. And as part of you say, well, what's the big deal about having fun? It's part of the total experience. If you go into a place and everything is so tight that you know, okay, I walk there and gosh, spend eight hours and I said, but if you walk and you walk and you feel good and you step out of that door, wherever you're going home and you feel good, then that's what it was all about. So it was, we did learning and we had fun and that was all about. Plus, if you know anything about Latinos, men without food and music, we go nowhere. Do we? <laughs> Cafecito, food and music. Must be. And then we do the learning and everything else. So. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, can I ask oh, a yeah. quick question? Yeah, sure. So, I'd like to go back to the 80s um, because I we did an oral history with one of us, a Latina, who was a student here at UF in the late 60s, early 70s. And she says, you know, while I was on that campus, I never met another Latina. Mm -hmm. And you don't know how lonely that was. Mm -hmm. And so, my question is, before the Institute was here, how did you find other Latinos? How did you find other Latino students or other Latino faculty, Dr. Fagundo, to, you know, support, <coughs> build community before this Institute was here? Well, fa faculty was relatively easy. There were only a few, so we only you know, <laughs> We know each other. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the students, it was much more complicated, of course, because, you know, the students in civil engineering, for example, were far removed from the law students or from the Romance language students. Uh, until organizations like this evolved, there was there were very few avenues mm -hmm. for students to meet. Unless, they were, remember, there was no computer, no Facebook, no, mm -hmm. none of these things. Like you had to do your own homework, a lot of search. Actually, you know, you just reminded me, who, I, I am you not a very, I wasn't a very social person. I, I knew almost no English, so I studied all the time. But it was San Agustin, and actually Holy Faith Church had a Spanish mm -hmm. service. And I used to walk from 16th Avenue North Southwest mm -hmm. all the way to Holy Faith, an hour and a half, and go to church on Sundays, and there was a Spanish service. Mm -hmm. And that's how we connected with some of the students from the university. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I remember it was pretty amazing because that's where we found each other. But otherwise, as he says, we we're all spread out in different yeah. places. Um, we had a handful in the College of Journalism, which is where I got my master's and my PhD. Um, but otherwise, if you're busy studying, which mm -hmm. at, at the graduate level, that's all you do, you don't, you don't really connect with a lot of people. You don't have a lot of time and there was not a space, but the Catholic Church and I've never been very religious, but it was a Spanish place. It was a place where people spoke Spanish once a week, so I was there. Yeah. We, we expanded, by the way. Uh, we, by the end, just before I left, 
<clears throat> we had representation from the College of Dentistry. Mm -hmm. We were trying to get a couple of student doctors, even though we knew how busy they were. I knew because of my husband how busy they were. <laughs> but we <coughs> wanted that involvement. Mm -hmm. And uh, we got one young lady, and I, her name escaping me at the moment. She was my mom's dentist. <laughs> my mom loved her. Uh, <laughs> and but. It was that those tentacles that we talk about. You know, it's just not about doing something insular over here and taking. It's that support out there. When yeah. we looked at the institute, we reached out to the Florida. We found out that Florida had a Hispanic commission right next to the governor's office. You know, that to us was important. So we met Conchi and Livia wrote letters to Conchi and I met with Conchi and we but she ended up being our keynote speaker for the for the so. It was National Council of La Raza. I was very involved with the National Puerto Rican Coalition. So it was bringing that support from the outside. Mm -hmm. Because even though educational institutions are about education and not politics, we're kidding ourselves if you don't think so. I will tell you, I have worked in politics after UF. It, educational institutions are more political than politics. Yeah. It's just a different monster, if you will, a different way of approaching politics. And they respond very much to outside pressure. You know, no president, no administration wants to be labeled anything negative. They obviously, understandably, want to show that under their leadership, an institution is the best and this and that. So the argument is not to go and criticize them in the paper because that's just going to get a, a, a backlash response. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the, the point would be to mm -hmm. make them see why by helping us and doing the things they enhance mm -hmm. and then that so that's mm -hmm. how we always approached it yeah yeah that's called strategic yeah <laughs> and, and i want to answer your question about um how it felt like mm -hmm. uh, that was the reason i transferred for uh, to um, <clears throat> santa fe community college because it was really isolating and even though you had the folks at the institute of uh, at the English Language Institute. I don't even know that institute exists anymore. Um, it, it was just very cold. And um, I, being a Latina from the Caribbean, it was just not my thing. And so when I moved to Santa Fe Community College, I was able to find more Venezuelans that kind of went from we're from the same regions and whatnot that I grew up. Mm -hmm. And immediately, I remember the 1982, 1982 was a, 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 a really difficult time for Venezuelan students here mm -hmm. at the, at the in, in, anywhere in the world, uh, because um, we had the fall of the oil prices. <coughs> And um, and our parents, even if they mm -hmm. had their savings to send us the money, or even the ones that were rich and could send the money, La Fuga de Divisas was closed, mm -hmm. so they could not buy dollars and send us money. Mm -hmm. So we all have to live in community. We ended up living in, in, in rooming houses all together, like 10 students in one bedroom apartment. And then we would just struggle <coughs> for food. And But it was a sense of community. I'm watching her mouth as you say that. She's like, I know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was a sense of community because I, I really remember that we all I mean I had like 12 students from different areas of, of Venezuela we never met in Venezuela we met here in Gainesville mm -hmm. and when that happened um, we all scraped the surface to get okay you find this I have my aunt in Miami she sent me tamales let's spill I mean we kind of cut things down to the little thing and the money that we could say some of us sold our cars to be able to pay the tuition for our friends and each other yeah. so it was a community that the people who were there at that time graduated because we had a community because we are Latinos because that's what we do when we are in need and uh, I tell you it was not at the University of Florida it was at a Santa Fe community college which is a smaller place so it's easier to find you know you can spot somebody from Valencia because of the way you walk and whatnot <laughs> you know you know you know, uh, for all of the Venezolanos out there, even though I was born in Cuba, I live in Venezuela from 7 to 25. So anyway, 
So, but that was the kind of spirit. And actually, the international student advisor, Lonnie Lone, with Santa Fe Community College, it actually allowed us to organize a lot of things. And it was like, okay, whatever you want to do, just do it. Yes. And and the, and it was a very different approach to the University of Florida. And it was, it was like always like you need them permission, a pink slip, and the other slip, and the other. And there was so much bureaucracy that by the time we end up signing all of the pieces of paper, do you remember that? <laughs> Oh. It just was like, come on. And so, see, that, those are the behind the scenes things that students were not aware. So, you know, they come <laughs> and this, and they get resolved. They had no idea yeah. the hoops that we had to go through. Yeah. Paper just to get a band to take him to the Martin Luther King Center and get some funding so that we can take him to, to a conference or to whatever. a conference yeah. or whatever. All the things that you have to do behind it to make that simple event happen. And, and why do, why do you need that? And why is that important? <laughs> and can you write on the same? Why, yeah, why, why do I need to take Latino students to the Martin Luther King Center? Yeah. Well, okay. Yeah. We're talking it's about just, diversifying yeah. our knowledge, mm -hmm. our exposure, our experiences. Mm -hmm. So it's not all about going to the Latino thing. It's yeah. more, you know, well, and it's also we have we have black Latinos too, exactly. and Afro Latinos, and exactly. what you know. So it's like uh, we're not just this very homo homogeneous and, group. And I will tell you, you know, you talk about UF, but just to give you a perspective, mm -hmm. I was a college student in the late, in mid seventies. Mm -hmm. I graduated in seventy four, <laughs> so I'm dating myself now. But <laughs> boy, it's getting scary when I get invited to my forty fifth reunion of high school. <laughs> <laughs> but the point was that I went through this. So when I came here, I went through that isolation to almost like she described it, you know. I I spent an entire year of college eating Campbell soups, eggs and bread and coffee, because that's all the money that I had. Mm -hmm. There was nothing else. My I come from a, a divorced family. I'm the first one in my entire family to go to college. Yep. So those were the struggles that we did. We had mm -hmm. to deal with language, you had to deal with culture, you had to deal with surviving, you know. And so I, when somebody says, well, I don't have those needs, I say, well, you're blessed. You're already starting at a different level, yeah. you know. Those are no things you have to worry about. You have to worry about expanding and exploring that mind. And when we did have students at the, uh, that, that, that came to the Institute that were Needy. single moms uh, taking care of three children, having three jobs, in studying business administration and also volunteering for the institute. So you would have daycare, institute, all kinds of things going on in there because it's, you know, different. And then there are different populations. There were the, the students that had money too. So, you and, know. But even having money doesn't mean your mm -hmm. problems were taken care no. of. I'll yeah. give you an example. No. No. I have a student walks into my office. I remember he's from Colombia. And he was distraught. He had had to leave on an emergency because his father had gotten ill. So, you know, in our families, when your parents get ill, you don't question. You just get on the plane or the car, whatever you need to do, and go. Yeah. Okay? So he had to leave an emergency, and he lost a semester. When he came he had a full scholarship. When he came back, financial aid said no. Mm -hmm. That's what walks into my office. Yeah. A student mm -hmm. with a full scholarship that just lost it is from an internal... What do we do? So what do I do? Rather than send them to see a counselor in financial aid, I went with them. Mm -hmm. And I asked to see that counselor, and I thought like heck, and I'm proud to say to you today, I got him that scholarship back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I made, because he, you know, it wasn't that he was incapable of doing his argument, but he needed an advocate at that moment. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you have to recognize you're not mm -hmm. your best advocate. Somebody else had to objectively make your points. He was too emotional because he was about to lose his, if he couldn't have that scholarship, he would have to return home. And the way goes his education, he didn't know when he could come back. So it was imperative. And so those are the little things, and those are the stories that, you know. Oh, so we're actually over time, but Ooh, we can maybe. Yeah. Um, and we just got <clears throat> into one question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, thank but, you so much. Yeah, this, this has been great, though. Um, I don't know if you had any, or did you have something? Well, I did, but it's, I guess it's too big of a question. Really. It's a big question? How big? We'll, we'll more, give you short answers. <laughs> I was, you yeah. talked about rekindling like, the community, rekindling the community. Mm -hmm. How do you think that's possible for the Hispanic community to come back together? Like, um, obviously, like, Black Hispanic community building is going to be the first step, but like, mm -hmm. where do you see it going? One suggestion I have is you find those people in the community, people like Wanda. Mm -hmm. Find people like Wanda. 
and one that will give you referral to other people in the community. Mm -hmm. And you get together in any form. Go down to Emiliano's, have a coffee with Wanda. Mm -hmm. And you know, Wanda, the Institute is going to be again, and we want to revive these and create new things or <coughs> change. You know, we had this program, but we want to modify it because we believe in it, but modernize it, if you will. That's how you start, one person at a time. You can't just call an assembly and put a hundred people in a room and expect miracles to happen. Sometimes it's those little meetings and dedication yeah. because it doesn't happen in one meeting and in one time. And I know, very quick, um, I, I think it would really help you to to have another, you know, like you have the, the Latino Student Council, mm -hmm. to have a council where you have people representing all of the different organizations sit down together and sort of like talk about what we envision together and do some kind of exercise if you have a facilitator even better um, on how to, you know, what are the steps, how do we want to, what kind of strategic plan do we want, uh, what do we expect to see happening. And, and then kind of involve everybody. If you involve the other students, they're going to get all, they're going to feel ownership of it. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be more successful than if, if you try to do just, uh, in, in, yeah, involve the community <coughs> in the conversation <coughs> too, because they're supporters. So there's different types of stakeholders, and we call it in planning. The <laughs> students, the community, and they all can support each other. The community is a big support to the students. And your faculty? Yeah. Find your faculty, and Milagros, and Milagros, and, Milagros <laughs> and, and all of the, the staff too, mm -hmm. uh, staff, administrative staff. Um, so do several visioning processes with the separate groups, and then do one with everybody together and see yeah, what comes and, out and of that. You have to remember, you know, the, what happened in the past is of interest. Yes. And we, yeah. we have successes and we have failures. Mm -hmm. But you're different. Mm -hmm. The exactly. world is different. Mm -hmm. Your views of the future are different. Yeah. So the new casita would probably evolve into something a little different from mm -hmm. what Correct. happened in the past. Yeah. So we have to keep that in mind. Yeah. But also remember one thing. There are a lot of people who have energy and ideas and desire to help. Sometimes they're busy, and, and if you reach out to them, they suddenly, yes, I'm there. I mean, I, I, she, yeah. she read to me a, an email that I sent her where I said I can help um, mm -hmm. at one time that she asked me for something. But most of the time, I put aside the time because yeah. most of the faculty members, and I'm speaking for, for professors, <clears throat> we have multiple responsibilities. But when our students come to us with things like this, we are also part of the community, and it's important for us not only to be represented, but to support the students. But, but let me defend her on that message. The, the importance of that message to me and why I kept it is she cared. She cared enough to send me an email and say, I'm there with you in spirit, although my life is so crazy with classes and everything now that I can't help you physically. But if I could do any little thing, let me know. So it's about that. because. Obviously, that was important to me that I saved that message. I, she thought it, I saw it as positive because I knew that if not now, in the future, I could come with Millie. Millie would be there for me. See? And find and those people, they're on campus, you know. Yeah. I mean, they're not a whole lot. I doubt that there's a lot of them now, <laughs> um, just like there were not many of us before. Mm -hmm. But we're there and we care. And sometimes we get involved in our own thing. But, but the Institute is another place to pull us yeah. and for us to be your advocates and for us to be your supporters. Okay. Thank you. Yay. You're welcome.